This is the Ross Developers Podcast, episode 117. Hello, Ross Developers, and welcome to the Ross Developers Podcast, the program, the podcast that gives you insights from the experts about how to program your robots with Ross. This is Ricardo from The Construct, and today I would like to dedicate this episode to all those people that are building robots for other people that are studying how to program robots. So those educational robots, you know, there are just a few of them there that are focused, especially on the ROS learning space. So if you are one of those that are building these kind of robots, you are helping us learn and understand better how to program robots with ROS, then this episode is dedicated to you. And especially if you are thinking about building just, just an idea, I don't know, maybe you are thinking about building an educational robot based on accelerated hardware, uh, then double dedication for you, okay? So just sharing ideas around there, I don't know. And why I'm telling you that? Yeah, because today we are going to go for the second round about accelerated hardware for robots that run ROS. But before going into that, um, let me tell you about the case when you need to learn about ROS. You need to learn how to program robots with ROS1, with ROS2. Then the best way, of course, is to go to the construct. We have an online academy where you can learn about uh, ROS1, all the subjects. ROS2 also, we are mastering navigation, manipulation, learning how to uh, d uh, master the concept of URDF, TF, all that. For ROS2 is already available at our online academy. And uh, you will learn by practicing with simulated robots. And you don't need to install anything on your computer. Just go to the academy, launch one of the course, and then the simulation will appear there directly. And as you progress, you will also be able to connect to our real robots that are located here in Barcelona in our offices, one room over there that you cannot see here. But uh, yeah, you, so you will connect to real robots like the one that we have here. Well, not that one, but another one, <laughs> other ones. So you can uh, connect to the real robots and practice with real robots also. You will, uh, you will connect to them and manage them remotely, trying your programs and so on. Those robots are available 24-7 or so, no problem. Then uh, have a look at the link that I will put here on the video description. And uh, also let me know what you think about this academy and what you would like us to include if it is missing. Okay, that's it. So now let's go for the meat of the episode, right? The thing that you are waiting here. And then for this episode, let me introduce you, Victor Mayoral. Victor has a large career in building ROS-based companies. So, <laughs> yes, several companies he has built. He, for example, was one of the founders of Erle Robotics, the first uh, company to deliver drones based on ROS. And also he has founded Alias Robotics, a company concentrated on providing security into ROS robots. And now he is uh, doing an excellent job with Acceleration Robotics, which is a company which is about, uh, well, let's see what it is about because we have Victor Mayoral here on the podcast. Victor, welcome to the podcast. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ricardo. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. You are here. That's the second time that you are here in the podcast. The first one was several years ago. Yeah, that, that's indeed the case. Yeah, I actually, if my mind um, is, is properly working right now, I think that the first one was exactly at the time you launched the uh, Ross Developers song. So uh, ah. very, very, very... Uh, 
pleased to be uh, sharing that episode. So here we are again. <laughs> okay, great. And also go going to talk about excellent subject and on the top, you know, on the edge of the technology for Ross Roberts, because, um, well, this is the second episode also that we are talking about acceleration hardware, accelerated, sorry, accelerated hardware. And can you explain to the audience what is uh, hardware acceleration and why is it important for robotics? Absolutely, yes. So hardware acceleration, in a nutshell, is a technique uh, that's using specialized equipment. Uh, like an FPGA or a GPU, to perform certain tasks uh, much more efficiently uh, than we typically uh, would do with a CPU, with the usual computer's processor. This is done by offloading certain robotic computations uh, from the CPU, from the processors, into the accelerators, uh, whether they are a GPU or an FPGA or other types of accelerators, that is um, to be decided. Uh, but that's pretty much what hardware acceleration is about. And as you can guess from this, there are various accelerators. Uh, I mentioned FPGA, which stands for Field Programmable Gate Arrays, uh, or GPUs, uh, which stand for Graphics uh, Processing Units. Um, the particular interesting case of, of the FPGAs are that they are very versatile. They are literally hardware that through software becomes different hardware. So a piece of electronics that through software can be literally uh, reconfigured, reprogrammed, and become a new piece of electronics. It's uh, It sounds like magic, but it isn't. Actually, it's a very old technology uh, that can be used for modern purposes, and it's extremely, extremely useful. Um, overall, when it comes to hardware acceleration, uh, one thing that I would um, encourage everyone to consider is the fact that CPUs, processors, address computations in robotics in a suboptimal manner, performance-wise. Uh, they present performance limitations due to their fixed uh, architectures uh, with a fixed number of cores, a fixed instruction set, often the case, and a rigid memory um, structure and architecture. Uh, they are memory-centric, often the case they are based on, on uh, von Neumann-based architectures, computer architectures, um, and essentially this is one of the big bottlenecks. Uh, FPGAs and other accelerators allow you to bypass these uh, limitations of these architectures, these fixed architectures, and with that deliver much more uh, performance in the uh, robotics pipeline, all the way from sensing information, going through control, perception, actuation, navigation, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I think that now it is clear why is it important for robotics because in robotics we have some operations that need to have a lot of uh, computation and then since if we use CPUs which are not thought for that type of computations, they can do it, of course, because CPUs are universal Turing machines, so they can do whatever, but they are not optimized. So we can switch to an FPGA that has been built or configured in the way that you mentioned, the, the electronics. So it's optimized for doing this kind of, of software, right? So that would be the, the special use in robotics. That's precisely the case, indeed, yes. Uh, CPUs are great. Uh, yeah. CPUs are widely used in robotics uh, yeah. due to their wide availability. However, they hardly provide uh, real-time and safety guarantees while delivering high throughput. This is actually the thing. Finding these balances between uh, providing real-time with high throughput and at the same time delivering and providing safety while performing those computations, that's one of the big challenges. Actually, in some um, ecosystems, this is often the case denominated as the CPU whack-a-mole. You know, as you're mixing things up, you end up with this guacamole sauce yeah. and then something might get too spicy or too salty. Uh, it is often the case very difficult to get the right amount of flavor as you keep adding more and more uh, ingredients. And that's the case in modern robotics, uh, in modern robots, because we keep adding sensors. And then we add another actuator or we switch to a new actuator because it became um, essentially uh, unusable anymore or because it's not sold any farther. And that imposes new bandwidth uh, requirements. And again, the whack-a-mole keeps uh, being added and added. And so there are some claims in the uh, systems architecture community uh, that's closer to robotics, uh, wherein uh, people essentially hold very strongly that uh, this is not a way to scale uh, robotics computer architecture, uh, that the way that this should happen is through well-identified compute units, uh, and essentially um, do deliver determinism and uh, well-known latency results. And that this can be uh, composed and scaled uh, as uh, systems get more and more complex, as hardware evolves, 
this is one of the things that uh, accelerators allows you to do uh, and one of the reasons why we got so involved in hardware acceleration. And now you mentioned a lot of different concepts which are very important for uh, accelerated hardware. One of them is about determinism. You mentioned determinism. Can you explain to the audience what is determinism and why is it important for robotics? Absolutely. Yes. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, determinism is ensuring that uh, the exact same computations happen in the exact same order every single time. A system is deterministic if that happens. Connected to determinism, we also have various other concepts, which often the case come up, things such as uh, latency or bandwidth uh, or throughput. Bandwidth and throughput refer to the same thing. Uh, it's important we differentiate between determinism, latency, and throughput. Um, determinism is, is what I just defined. Uh, latency uh, is something a bit different. Uh, it's the time between the start and the completion, the finish of a particular computation task. That's what latency is all about. Whereas throughput is making sure that the total amount of work gets done in a given amount of time. So we generally in robotics want um, computation systems that deliver us um, low latency results uh, because we want to make sure that essentially the time between the start and the completion of that computation task is as small as possible so that we can pack more while delivering high throughput. Uh, so that the total amount of work, that's what throughput is per time of unit, uh, is maximized. Uh, now, this often the case also conflicts with determinism. Again, making sure things happen uh, in the exact same order every single time. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, but why is that? For example, I can understand latency and uh, throughput. It's important for robotics because, well, f throughput, for example, uh, it's important in case that you want to capture all the data of a sensor and process quickly so you can provide an, an answer. And that would be a high throughput because you need to capture all the data from the point cloud, for example. And then uh, latency will be important because uh, since you give the order to the robot to turn, then you want the robot to, to turn as fast as possible. So it takes, it delays as, uh, as less as possible. But determinism, why is it important that always gives the same answer to the same situation? Well, the thing is that uh, robots are deterministic machines, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they need to be predictable in order for us to, to make some um, useful use out of them in, in, in real scenarios, whether there is uh, our houses, uh, public environments, or industries. Uh, so, so determinism uh, is key in, in the overall robotics uh, ecosystem, I would say. That's at least uh, one of the lessons you learned after a few years involved. Um, determinism is also uh, often the case very connected to uh, latency results. So if you're able to essentially uh, have proper deterministic systems, you can very accurately uh, estimate the uh, latency that your system will deliver. Okay, I didn't know about that. Yeah. So it is, it, is pretty, uh, it is pretty relevant to consider those two things. Again, often the case not um, differentiated, but I think for the sake of, of getting down to, to complicated concepts, uh, and hardware acceleration is complicated, Let, let's be clear about that. We need to be also um, very specific about these terms. And then since we are bringing terms, there's yet another term, right, which is real time. Okay. It's widely used, widely used, and um, in my humble experience, often the case a bit, um, a bit of a conflict because, uh, and this is the funny thing, depending on which community you speak uh, about, real time means something different. It shouldn't be the case, right? But it is, um, and I'll tell you now about my experiences there. But real time, in nutshell, in robotics, uh, in, implies uh, making sure that your computation tasks. Uh, meet uh, their time deadlines. Uh, system is, is real time if, if, if all of the tasks meet the corresponding deadlines they've been specified. If all of the deadlines are, are met always, then that system is uh, considered as a real time system, often the case denominated as a hard real time system. If it does not meet uh, all of the deadlines, then we start getting into this gray area where we can consider whether that is a firm real time system or a soft real time system. But I think we can leave that for another session. Um, <laughs> the better thing here is that the fact is that um, real time is all about meeting the deadlines. So making sure that if um, your control uh, loop uh, needs to respond at a, 
I don't know, 100 hertz or 1,000 hertz, 1 kilohertz, then it does deliver. Uh, the calculations and the computations are, are meeting those requirements. Um, it can be very fast or very slow, but that's uh, disconnected to real-time capabilities. Um, now, interestingly, uh, in other areas, for example, in the cybersecurity area, real-time is often the case a synonym of fast, of real fast, mm -hmm. responsive. Um, they don't account for this um, control-based uh, definition of real-time, which is the one we used uh, mm -hmm. in, in robotics coming from cybernetics, uh, the theory of control. So, um, so again, uh, conflicts in terminology, and of course, uh, this leads to more and more complexity in system integrating robots. So, um, so anyhow, um, this all needs to be very clear for what concerns uh, hardware acceleration, and it needs to be specifically clear for all those robotic systems architects and robotic architects out there, because at the end of the day, um, building modern robotic systems implies, to a big extent, um, optimizing their computation systems. And that's what architects do. And that's what we empower with hardware acceleration in a way. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. And uh, you mentioned that this is a complex thing. Yeah, that's why we are here. Right, we like it, and we, that's what uh, is interesting to us. Otherwise, we will be doing I don't know coffee, <laughs> <laughs> coffee. <laughs> no, that's definitely that's definitely a well said uh, sentence. Uh, we're, we're in here in robotics for for the fun. Definitely. For the fun, not exactly. Not for the money. Most of the ca in most of the cases. In most of the cases, no. Not for the fun. Yeah, and uh, also you mentioned about. Uh, real time and then let me put an example for the audience that would be real time when we want real time you use you provide a very precise definition of it then let me put an example of this that would be that when we have real time that when the computer calculation says that the hand of the robot is going to be here at this step of time it's going to be then based on the movement and everything of the robot the, the hand will be at that time so what we have computed is actually what has been produced, right? Will be something. Hello. Uh, I think you. I think you got it. Yeah. I mean, timing-wise, uh, mm -hmm. your hand reached the desired position in the allotted amount. Of amount time. of time. Exactly. exactly. Okay. So it's gonna make it within that amount of time. It can be. Uh, it can. It needs to be within that amount of time if it's real time. If it's later, then it's not real time. Exactly, and that's important for some concept. For example, if you are playing ping pong with a, a human, then you need to be at the proper position so you can compute. For example, the trajectory of the of the ball. You can see the trajectory. You are super cool. The the computer, but then moving the hand, it doesn't have real time. Then it's not at the correct position when it has to be. For example. Something. That's a fantastic example, Ricardo, yeah. and I'm, I'm going to steal it from you. Okay, yeah, yeah, so for free, <laughs> even for free. <laughs> okay, great. Then, uh, what, am I, what, what about, so, um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, how did you realize the importance of hardware acceleration for robots? Well, I mean, so the, the reality is that, um, and I'm going to get back to this analogy of, of the whack-a-mole, right? So mm -hmm. often the case, you are building robots and you have a limited hardware um, amount of capabilities, right? You have your, your CPUs uh, and most people um, and most people in the ROS ecosystem uh, tend to build robotic systems in a CPU-centric manner. And that's, again, that's okay. They are very versatile, von Neumann-based architectures with fixed uh memory structures, uh, which give us lots of limitations, but that eventually, as you grow and more and more in com into complexity, then you start encountering uh, bottlenecks, bottlenecks in terms of latency, in terms of latency versus throughput, right? Uh, bottlenecks in terms of ensuring that all your computations meet their deadlines. So, so achieving real time, technically speaking. And as the uh, robotic system grows more and more, uh, as, there's, as there are more and more uh, packages, ROS packages, and as there are more and more ROS nodes, uh, your computational graph becomes something very, very challenging to maintain. Uh, actually, um, for years, uh, when I had to explain um, ROS and, and how robots were built from a software perspective, we use this analogy wherein the computational graph is the brain of the robot, right? And so uh, the actual intelligence or behaviors are, um, are somehow... Um, I would say 
they they flow from the graph in a way that the information flow goes from the sensors into the computational graph and from the computational graph to the corresponding actuators, right? So in a way, there's there's some sort of like bio-inspired approach in this explanation, but it all dives down to the computational graph, ensuring everything runs as you expect. So uh, with all of this together, what you realize is that um, eventually you run out of uh, capabilities and you need to jump into the next thing, into the next um, hardware platform, the next CPU, the next Raspberry Pi, the next whatever uh, people's using out there these days. Uh, and that becomes that becomes a huge amount of work, system integration work, right? And often the case, uh, it's not so portable. Uh, of course, software is very portable, but uh, when you want to ensure that certain latencies, certain uh, deadlines are met, then you depend very much on the speed processor. You are somehow playing around with hardware aspects. So it, it does become very, very hard. Again, the guacamole uh, analogy, just mixing new ingredients and making your sauce larger and larger. So preserving the same flavor is very challenging. That's pretty much uh, what this is all about. So um, I think... Um, I think, I guess early on, I did realize that as I guess most robotic architects out there uh, do, um, after having gone a few times over this porting to get the newest uh, reference uh, SVC, uh, single board computer, uh, you start getting tired. Uh, you realize this is very hardly uh, scalable into production systems, into real robotic systems out there. And you start for looking for alternatives. And that's where um, I guess I discovered uh, the exciting world of accelerators uh, and how you can offload computations to specific accelerators that give you determinism, that give you well, low, um, well understood and low latencies. And that allow you to literally build modular systems from a hardware and software perspective that do scale. Uh, despite you moving to a new piece of hardware, if the accelerators remain, you can scale things equally. Okay, makes perfect sense. It's exciting. I wanted to ask you this question because I didn't know about this acceleration, hardware acceleration until, I mean, I heard that you were doing things and so on, but I never <laughs> get into the deep and, and realize the importance of this uh, until recently, until recently. So that's why I was so interested on this. And then based on that, so... Then what happened? So afterwards, you you are creating a new company, which is called Acceleration Robotics. I will put a link to the company on the show note of the video. And so what do you do there in this company? Very good question. And also, I think, very appropriate pointer. Um, it's not only you, Ricardo. Many, many people find themselves uh, very new uh, yeah. to, uh, to hardware acceleration. Yeah. Um, but frankly speaking, if we think about it, uh, hardware acceleration has been with us for lots, lots of time. Uh, it is uh, essentially the technology behind um, various revolutions. Uh, first, the gaming revolution. Gaming is, is only possible thanks to the fact that we leverage hardware accelerators, not only GPUs, but there are alternatives as well. Um, second, AI. Uh, AI started growing uh, popularly uh, at the point where we started leveraging hardware accelerators to speed up security. Yes. Uh, the training, inference, right. uh, pretty much everything related to uh, machine learning techniques. That was the point where AI started exploding. Yeah, that's right. Hardware acceleration in robotics is very new, and you're right about that. And we've been pioneering much of that while cooperating with silicon vendors. Uh, but we are really excited about what this can bring to the robotics ecosystem. Uh, we are super, super excited, and we truly believe that hardware acceleration can change the robotics landscape. It can bring significant speed-ups to robotic computations. We've been demonstrating that for more than um, two years now. Uh, and that's exactly, exactly, exactly what we do in acceleration robotics. Um, so in a nutshell, we consult uh, for robotic companies that want to improve their performance in robotic computations. And we also design semiconductor building blocks for robots. Uh, we do this uh, while collaborating with uh, the most popular uh, silicon vendors in the world out there. And in a nutshell, technically speaking, for the uh, ROS developer out there, what we do is we fork ROS packages and we improve them by adding hardware acceleration capabilities, creating IP cores, or as we call them, robot cores, uh, which delivers a speed up uh, and increased capabilities in terms of performance per watt, power consumption, uh, determinism, and also throughput capabilities, um, reaching numbers, for example, as we've been reporting um, for the last couple of years, 
that uh, help improve, for example, uh, ROS perception, uh, computations all the way up to 10 times, or even specific nodes all the way up to 500 times. So these are wow. just some of the numbers we are producing in the ROS to hardware acceleration working group, actually. Okay, I was going to ask you about some examples of other packages that you have uh, hardware accelerated, let's see, because when we say, uh, so you have ported one package of ROS into hardware acceleration system, that means that you have to modify the code inside the, the ROS package, right? Because it has to run in a different way. That's correct, that's correct. Actually, often the case, it's a significant rewrite. Not only at the, uh, let's say, user space layer 7 of the OSI stack uh, level, uh, mm -hmm. so not only at the, let's say, raw stacks level, but often the case you need to modify things across the raw stack to make sure that that parallelism is exploitable. Uh -huh. uh, this is one of the things we're working uh, with some of our partners and some of our clients. Uh, again, as I said, we, we serve some of the biggest semiconductor companies uh, out there uh, very closely. So... Um, what we do, technically speaking, is uh, let's just pick one example. Image pipeline is one of the most popular packages in the perception uh, uh, stack of the ROS ecosystem. So we fork image pipeline and we essentially uh, make computations in a different manner by, by leveraging either specialized languages or a different way of programming things that allows us to exploit parallelism. Often the case, this involves creating what's called acceleration kernels. Um, which are specific cores of computation that run into hardware accelerators, into GPUs or into FPGAs. Now, the way to program these systems traditionally was completely different uh, than how we do modern software engineering. Fortunately, these days, things are getting closer and closer. Um, so you can just grab a, a piece of C++ code and adding, in some cases, uh, certain annotations, certain C pragmas, uh, you can actually convert it into an acceleration kernel. So this is one of the ways uh, forward. In some other cases, with some other accelerators, you need to use completely different uh, subsets or extensions of the C++ language, which allow you to, again, rewrite the piece of code so that it performs uh, more efficiently. It's, um, it's very fun, but this is actually um, the reality behind hardware acceleration. And often the case, you hear people saying out there, I use GPUs uh, all the time. I mean, every single time. And then you ask this person or this group, um, all right, so you, you use GPUs, that's fantastic. So you program in CUDA. And then they get confused and they say, no, 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 I don't program in CUDA. And, and that's the case for most of the people. You know, um, the CUDA programming or HLS programming in the case of FPGAs is actually very rare, very rare. Only very few people has the technical skills and also the, the technical interests to dive deep down into this um, accelerators world. Um, but that is what's required. Um, technically speaking, um, when you're leveraging your GPU, you're actually leveraging uh, an acceleration kernel that someone else, another person, created for you. Um, and you're leveraging that accelerator all the way uh, via whatever APIs uh, are offered. Um, but that is what technically implies uh, using GPUs. Um, so, so, yeah, that's pretty much what's required to... Um, leverage hardware acceleration these days with, uh, with ROS. And we invite everyone to check very closely the resources in the ROS2 Hardware Acceleration Working Group, which we've been essentially uh, publishing for more than a year now, and which allow you, which allow everyone to get up to speed with hardware acceleration very easily. But what is this uh, Hardware Acceleration Working Group? Right. So the, the ROS2 Hardware Acceleration Working Group is a community working group in the ROS community. Uh, essentially that drives the creation, maintenance, and testing of uh, hardware acceleration technologies in a vendor agnostic and technology agnostic manner. Uh, by that, we mean we want to make sure that uh, roboticists out there can essentially leverage hardware acceleration without getting into all the complexity required to go all the way deep down to understanding every single architecture of every single silicon solution out there. We want them to maintain a ROS2 API-centric view. And then we're creating the corresponding uh, interfaces and conventions so that silicon vendors can come out there and, you know, um, make their solutions integrated. Exactly, See. integrated. Uh, so we are working essentially with the stakeholders from, from the different sources needed uh, to make sure that uh, it is very easy for everyone to build their ROS nodes for a GPU or from an FPGA from a different vendor by just simply adding a flag uh, to their Qualcomm build commands. That, uh -huh. That's the magic we do. And we do that by providing a variety of different contributions, which can be seen in the in the hardware 
uh, working in the Harvard Acceleration Working Group. So that's what the working group focuses uh, mainly on, but there are also other projects and other activities involving uh, benchmarking, involving um, specialized new uh, CPU uh, constructs that we're making, and I'll be happy to tell you about it. That's something of interest. Oh, okay. So I uh, will put a link on the show note to that uh, ROS2 Hardware Acceleration Group because you are one of the most active uh, ROS2 working groups that have been created comple every week. There is a new meeting with new advancement, new software. So for the people that is interested on hardware acceleration with ROS, then you should check definitely about this uh, working group of ROS, which is amazing. And um, yeah. and and then, uh, so do you, do you think, based on your experience, do you think that the ROS developers that are listening here, they should care about learning how to program hardware acceleration uh, Accelerated hardware, I mean? I, I definitely think so. Uh, but of course, this this uh, comes down very much to uh, what is your uh, desire uh, to work as, as a roboticist. Not all roboticists do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, often the case, we're very specialized. Uh, if your interest is on, on computer architecture, if your interest is on uh, building robot brains in simple terms, then definitely yes. yes. Uh, understanding about how to optimize uh, your computations, understanding more about data flows, understanding more about how to optimize uh, ROS computational graph so that you can offload part of the computational graph, a subgraph, into an accelerator, that's going to be key in the, um, not future, in the current uh, or very near term. Uh, and that's uh, increasingly being required by many companies out there. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing more and more companies publishing job offers that have requirements for FPGA knowledge or GPU knowledge. Uh, so this is going to become a constant uh, situation as it is these days in the gaming world or in the AI world. Yeah, yeah. I think that you put an, a very good example on the explosion of deep learning, which was possible because of this accelerated hardware that they started to use in order to train the neural networks. And then what you are indicating is that we are right now, not, not the next year, this year, on this possible explosion in robotics for, by, using, by applying accelerated hardware into the robotics tasks. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and the beauty behind this, if you allow me, is that sure. it's not it's not one case specific. It's actually generic across the ROS stacks. It can apply to manipulation, it can yeah. apply to navigation, it can apply to ROS control, to ROS perception, it can apply to all of these stacks. It is it is a very, very exciting field. And as you were saying, it's a very vibrant community at the same time. Not just the Ross community, which we all know uh, it's great, and Ricardo is guilty on making it greater. I think, but <laughs> overall, the uh, the the Ross to Hardware Acceleration Working Group is packing together every single month because we are meeting once per month. Um, hundreds of folks who registered online, and then uh, dozens of them show up at every single meeting. We've had almost 100 persons simultaneously uh, showing up in a Ross working group meeting, which is mind blowing if you compare them to, to oh. all of the other working groups. Yeah. Uh, and we have hundreds and hundreds of people visiting our resources, reaching out, the amount of, of work that's behind the scenes is, is significant, but also very exciting. It, it shows that uh, there is a big opportunity. Also it shows how the silicon semiconductors world is somehow converging into robotics. And that's that's very interesting for us, Rosers, because it means uh, that one of the most profitable um, areas uh, in technology these days, which is the semiconductors world, is entering very deeply into uh, our ecosystem and is doing it uh, hand by hand uh, with Ross. Uh, so we would like to believe we're behind that um, and we are somehow influencing that. And towards that influence, uh, maybe one thing I can point out, if Ricardo allows me, is for folks out there to check out some of our standardization efforts. Uh, there mm -hmm. are various that we are uh, pushing forward. The first one is uh, Rep 2008, uh, which I shared uh, with Ricardo. Okay. For the chat. Uh, that, that sets together a series of reference architecture and conventions on how to introduce hardware acceleration in the ROS ecosystem. Again, conventions to make sure silicon vendors and uh, hardware manufacturers as well as ROS users get together and agree on how to make this fitting. Another one we're also very, very excited and proud of is um, something we've called uh, Red 2014, mm -hmm. uh, 
which in a nutshell um, stands for uh, an ongoing effort to uh, set up a reference benchmarking um, ecosystem for uh, performance benchmarking ROS computations. Why is it important to have a benchmarking? Well, uh, for many reasons. Uh, the most relevant one is because uh, when, we, um, when we somehow evaluate uh, how optimal our computations are executed, we always need a baseline. Uh, we always need a reference uh, benchmark. Benchmarks allow us to compare different algorithms executing the same task, and we can compare them across non-functional aspects, such as uh, how much latency they require, how much uh, bandwidth they produce out of that, how much power they consume. So again, different algorithms executing the same task, but also it allows us to compare different hardware uh, across the same task. We can compare all sorts of things and getting together on how to perform benchmark in a reproducible, again, super complex in this field, and consistent manner uh, is crucial, especially because as we've been observing, uh, and again, I'm going to put a, an example out of the AI world, um, often the case, big companies just use benchmarks as marketing, but it's, it's so unusable because every single one makes their own assumptions, and so they are incomparable. So getting together on comparing apples with apples and oranges with oranges and peers with peers, it's super crucial, especially in, in, in the Ross world where when we have fragmentation of, of packages just by definition. So let's leverage that, let's exploit that, and let's make sure we have proper benchmarking tools. And that's, uh, again, an ongoing effort um, that's been uh, wrapped as part of uh, Ross enhancement proposal, RED 2014. Uh, yeah, and that. So, how this um, benchmarking system is related with robot perf? That uh, your company uh, Acceleration Robotics is is developing, and also pr uh, it's available to the market, right? Robot perf. Absolutely, yeah. Robot perf, uh, in fact, is an open project. Uh, it's not just ourselves, uh, or, or that's uh, technically what's happening. And I'm gonna also gonna share a link with uh, with. The audience in here. Mm. So Robot Perf uh, is an open project wherein we are trying to put together a suite of reference benchmarking uh, tests for robotics. And we are doing so across, initially, six categories um, that essentially pack together the most relevant computations that often the case you care about mm. uh, in robotics. And we are doing this um, essentially in partnership also with academia. So we started this activity uh, with Harvard. Uh, we are leading uh, much of the effort also by leveraging much of our experience in hardware acceleration for the last uh, many months and couple of years. Um, but pretty much we're inviting everyone from industry and academia to uh, reach out, to partner up with us and to build together uh, reference benchmarking uh, tests for uh, robotic systems. Uh, because frankly speaking, there's lots of complexity under the hood uh, and only by grouping together and by pushing forward together will get there uh, with usable results, which is at the end of the day uh, what we want to achieve. Um, technically speaking, for a ROS user out there, what Robot Perf is really is a, um, a meta ROS package, a package of packages that you can git clone, uh, that you can fork, or that you can fetch into your workspace, that you mm -hmm. can um, call con, build it. And that allows you to launch a series of um, performance tests for known workloads in robotics that are related to ROS packages, uh, whether it's Movid or whether it's the perception stack or whether it's navigation tube. And they give you an estimate in your particular target hardware uh, reference okay. platform, how well, how bad you're doing it. Ah, okay, yeah. So that's like those in the past. Do you remember when we started with the computers with the PCs? Uh, and well, I don't know if you remember because you are very young, but... <laughs> In my case, I do. I do remember. On the, and then we had those uh, kind of tests that they were testing how many polygons they can be created in the new computer that you have bought in the Pentium, whatever, at that time. And then they were running different types of tests. And then at the end, they produced a result. So that would be the same, but in terms of accelerated hardware, right? Not only accelerated hardware, in terms of robotic computations. The in general, is, okay. Is that the target is robotic computations. Okay, and okay, I see. You can, you can run them with or without. Without. Acceleration. Exactly. And, and actually, that's a great point, Ricardo, yeah. because in some cases, yeah. hardware acceleration um, does not accelerate, it decelerates. Mm -hmm. 
uh, this is something interesting, right? Uh, and often the case very, um, uh, I would say, somehow obscured. Um, and, and, and that's where in the architects come in uh, to design proper computer architectures. But mm -hmm. overall, um, it, is, it is designed in a generic manner um, to evaluate <clears throat> the performance of any robotic computation. Again, considering those six initial categories, but scaling up as we get more and more partners, as we get more and more interest, and as we grow it more and more. Okay, so for the audience that is there, if you are listening, and then I think that could be you, you could also uh, participate in improving these uh, metrics, those metrics, in the point that is interesting, interesting for you. So let's say you are building some libraries for image processing, and then you would like to to provide this performance meter for your libraries in different platforms, so the the your possible buyers can decide in which uh, architecture to run your libraries better, then maybe you can contribute also here to this project. So I'm calling you to, to help uh, <laughs> Victor and, and, uh, and the team, and the team that is led by him on this improving and contributing to the robot uh, perf. That's, that's a great call. And, and um, <laughs> just echoing that, uh, definitely, if you're building... Uh, lidars, or if you're building uh, cameras, or any other piece of hardware, or act, I mean sensors or actuators, and you want to benchmark yourself against alternatives, uh, or you're building compute uh, systems for robots, uh, then we are happy to partner up. Uh, come join us in the Robot Perf project. Uh, we'll find a way uh, to make sure we can meet your needs uh, while at the same time contributing openly, which is the goal of Robot Perf. Awesome. Awesome. I will put a link on the show notes also about RoboPerf and also directly to your LinkedIn so they can contact you personally in case they want. And then uh, we have, uh, so we have talked about RoboPerf, which is some project that your company is leading and developing, but also there is another product from your company which is called Robot Core. So what is Robot Core and for which types of robotics applications do you recommend its use? So Robot Core is a reference hardware platform for um, testing, for prototyping, for researching uh, with hardware accelerators. Mm. Um, in a nutshell, it is uh, a box that I've got in here actually. Can you um, show us? Either. Ah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so here it is. That will be awesome. this, is, uh, this is one of our existing uh, prototypes. Inside, that's the beauty of it. Uh, back it out. So inside, it packs actually uh, modern uh, accelerators. So we have, uh -huh. on one end, uh, we have uh, so solutions from AMD uh, that leverage uh, an FPGA SOC, so four ARM cores plus an FPGA. And then on the other side, we pack uh, technology from NVIDIA, uh, which packs together a GPU, uh, also with uh, CPU cores and many, many accelerators inside. So these two pieces together um, give you, again, a reference hardware platform to start prototyping, testing out, building your computational graphs with ROS. Uh, and so we pack it all and we uh, somehow offer it as part of our Robot Core uh, family of products. Robot Core for us is itself our family, uh, which we use to pack together also our IP cores, this uh, acceleration kernels that we design uh, specifically for FPGAs or, or GPUs. And of course, um, we also have the reference hardware you can use to test them out. Um, Robot Core itself, the, the hardware piece, is actually uh, open source and open hardware. Uh, so we disclosed oh. all design files, uh, mechanical, the bill of materials, everything is out there. Um, and it's also part of our vision. Uh, this vision that we somehow summarize in what we uh, phrase as the robotic processing unit. Um, we strongly believe that as we mature more and more um, robotic software and robotic computer architectures, we're essentially going to uh, realize how we can optimize certain um, computations in robotics by not specifically leveraging CPUs, but maybe alternative uh, acceleration kernels. These acceleration kernels could be uh, really, literally synthesized in hard cores. So, so often the case when you design uh, an IP core or a an acceleration kernel for an FPGA. You can synthesize it as a soft core, which runs inside of the FPGA, or as a hard core, and literally becomes a chip, a physical uh, chip. So uh, we have this vision wherein um, eventually uh, we will pack together um, enough IP, enough uh, knowledge and experiences that it would lead us to come up with this concept of a processing unit specialized for robotic systems. 
Until then, we have RobotCore, which is a base reference hardware platform for prototyping on robotic uh, computer architecture, and which allows us literally um, to get a speed up uh, in robotic computations, specialized and focused in ROS. That's the key thing and why we differentiate ourselves uh, from others out there. We, everything we do is ROS connected, specifically ROS chip connected. Okay, and this uh, robot core, uh, you mentioned that it's open source, so anybody can go to the specifications on the website, link on the show notes for that, but also they can order from you, right? If we don't want to be- get messed into <laughs> building all these things, and then we just want to work with it, because that's what we are interested in. So can we order from, uh, from your company? Sure, sure definitely. And uh, often the case, we, uh, we have a few customers, which, uh, as you said, They don't want to build it themselves. Uh, but the real value uh, that comes from us is not precisely just on the hardware, but it's also on the IP cores, on the acceleration kernels, uh, kernels things such as uh, robot core perception, which is a fork of the ROS perception stack, uh, which gives you a speed up when compared to the CPU uh, vanilla implementation. Or robot core transform, which gives you a five times the speed up on using TF2. Again, Uh, designed for robot core, but also portable to other GPUs and FPGAs out there. So that's the real value and the often the case, the relationship we have with our customers. Uh, for the majority out there, uh, we very much recommend you to check out the design files out there. You can build your own robotic processing unit or your own version of, of robot core. Um, and, and with it, start playing, start learning, start innovating, and start building your own um, IP blocks that hopefully uh, will help um, speed up robots uh, in the future. Okay. And then uh, you mentioned all those um, uh, packages that you have kind of fork and translated into accelerated hardware. So you mentioned the one of Perception and also the one for TF. And uh, which other ones have you? Because yeah, I know that you have also created some other interesting one, and maybe the audience is interested on learning about those. Uh, definitely, a uh, great question. So for now, what we have uh, made public are those two: uh, the perception stack uh, fork, uh, which we advertise as Robot Core uh, Perception, and then the Transform one. Those are the ones we have made public, but we're working on new ones, definitely. Um, and what I can tell uh, the audience is point them specifically to uh, one uh, report that we conducted last year, um, which summarizes what's the state of demand of in the hardware acceleration uh, ecosystem. And we are driving ourselves uh, from this. Um, mm. And I'm sharing with Ricardo here the link. Yeah, it's an good. excellent report. I have read it and it's, it's very good. Uh, yeah, very detailed and goes to the, the points. So, so uh, answering your question, we are uh, focusing what people out there is telling us we should be focusing. So we conducted a survey. Uh, what came out as the most popular choice uh, was perception, and that is what we focused on first. Uh, and there are other alternatives which come also uh, very requested, things such as accelerating simulation uh, by means of FPGAs or GPUs in workstations, not in edge computers, as in this case. Things such as, for example, accelerating uh, the ROS2 core uh, stack, uh, the DDS implementation and the underlying networking stack, the UDP IP stack, that's often the case leverage. That is something that we've also heard people want very much. But also other stacks such as uh, navigation and manipulation are things we are looking into. Uh, so that's something you can expect uh, from us at some point. And if you're interested, reach out and happy to collaborate. Yes, also, I think that, that for all the ROS developers out there that are looking for a project to contribute, those are super, super interesting and also on the edge of robotics. So in case that you are there and you don't want to, where to put your, into practice your new skills learned at the Construct Academy, for example, so you can contact, uh, you can contact Victor and then participate and collaborate into those projects because Everybody is going to win on this. You are going to win learning a lot, and the community is going to get those packages, and uh, also the companies, they are going to do business, and, and everything is, is winning, so that's very cool. And uh, then, oh, yeah, I wanted to ask you one question. So uh, could be that the hardware, the accelerated hardware, And so makes irrelevant the use of the cloud in robotics applications? Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's a deep question. And, uh, <laughs> What do you think? It may take, it may take, us, uh, it may take us a long time, and I think we don't have so much time. Okay. But um, let, me, let me try to be brief uh, for yeah. the sake of time. So, uh, no, I don't think so. 
Okay, uh, why not? Do something. So I, um, I think that uh, robotics has an intrinsic edge component, and it's always going to remain. I think there are some voices out there in the community who advocate against this. Uh, there are some companies out there trying to advertise everything should be cloud cloud based. I I do not agree with this. Uh, and everything I've learned as a roboticist hints that. Um, edge is a key uh, aspect of robotics autonomy, which should remain and which should be considered. Uh, uh, robotic compute architectures uh, are still going to have an important edge component to them. And that's why hardware acceleration is so important across technologies and across domains. It is important in the edge or on the edge. It's important in the workstation while you do development, simulation, iterations, um, all even workstations are also very relevant right now in many scenarios that we are um, hearing a lot about. For example, AMRs get coordinated by a centralized system. Often the case, this centralized system runs with a workstation that leverages hardware acceleration incrementally. So that's one great use case. Um, then we have uh, essentially uh, the cloud, uh, which merges also data centers in a way. Um, so the cloud is is crucial. Um, the cloud is crucial uh, because we have unlimited amount of compute, right? But not only off CPU, also off hardware accelerators. So one of the things people uh, don't know um, often the case is uh, that cloud service providers uh, such as Azure or such as GCP, Google, Cloud Platform or AWS, they um, they do provide huge uh, cloud instances that provide a big FPGA or a huge GPU. And so uh, what this means is that you can exactly leverage the same exact hardware acceleration capabilities that you have on the edge, but also in the cloud. So um, that's one of the exciting things we are exploring also. Um, in fact, we published a paper last year, uh, and I think a second uh, iteration of that's going to be published in ICRA. Uh, I just, uh, I think I just got reported, it, it got accepted. Uh, and I collaborated with uh, Berkeley, uh, with UC Berkeley on this. Uh, we called this project Fog Ross. Um, and in a nutshell, uh, it aims to bring parts of the computational graph, parts, subgraphs, into uh, the cloud. But into the cloud means into CPU instances and potentially other instances. So that's that was part of the contributions that I made to this job, how essentially we could not only offload computations to the cloud uh, in a CPU-centric manner, but also while leveraging accelerators. And that's uh, that's something very exciting that we have, and that's exactly what we pack as part of Robot Core Cloud, uh, which are tools that allow you to do this very, very easily. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, I see. Well... Yes, I, I, I was just trying to see if we could simplify a little bit the robotics landscape because we have so many cloud edge on board and all that. So, but I, I see, I see from your answer that that's not possible. And yeah, so that's also a complexity of the systems that we are in, and that's why we are here because we like it. <laughs> Then, uh, what can we expect from acceleration robotics in the next years? What secret projects are you working on? Um, nothing, nothing really secret. To be frank, we're very open. Um, uh, our strategy is very clear. We are making sure that ROS packages run faster, uh, more deterministically, and while consuming less power. That is pretty much the general um, expectation you should have out of us, and you can expect us to continue leading and spearheading the uh, robotics community to collaborate with silicon vendors. It's super important. Uh, we continue collaborating with them. Uh, we continue engaging them and telling them what we want as roboticists so that we don't reach uh, locking situations such as it happened in the AI world or it happened in the gaming industry. So we're trying to learn out of those lessons and, and trying to keep a balanced ecosystem wherein, you know, there's fair play and various silicon vendors, various ac accelerated, uh, sorry, companies providing hardware accelerators can play fairly and equally by comparing them fairly first and also by giving them the exact same games in the in the role or roles of the game, um, sorry, that allows us as consumers, uh, <laughs> us as users, cool. to have an easy life. Not the other way around, <laughs> which is often the case, what you find. So that's what you can expect uh, out of us. And to everyone out there, awesome. I would echo again uh, my claim. Hardware acceleration is going to change the robotics landscape. Uh, the best most impressive robots out there these days are using 
hardware accelerators. And that's actually their special sauce. If you think about Boston Dynamics, they pack accelerators, and that's what makes them so impressive in many ways from a computational perspective. Um, there are many, many scenarios like this. Um, the overall observation is that pretty much everyone is catching up, so should you. Uh, so please get involved. Please contribute to the ROS2 Hardware Acceleration Working Group and reach out for anything uh, you may want to ask. Okay, excellent. Excellent. So I think that this is our last question for this podcast. Thank you very much, Victor, for such interesting conversation and so many points in my brain now they are starting to get a lot of ideas based on that because we didn't pay so much attention uh, i'm sincere to you and then recently i start to get those inputs and then uh, we got in contact uh, with you and uh, in order to do this podcast and that's starting to explode into many many directions so thank you very much victor for being here my pleasure and uh, best regards to everyone and wishing a fantastic 2023 for everyone Great. And uh, well, that's all for today for this episode of the ROS Developers Podcast. Remember to send us an email telling us what do you think about the podcast, what you would like to have in the podcast, uh, errors, uh, improvements, anything. And give us five stars wherever you are listening or watching this and likes and all those. That is all for today. So see you next week with a new lesson from the experts. And until then, keep pushing your ROS learning.